Uh, I'm John Beck. I'm the Deputy Director of Arts Boston, and I'm here to talk to you today about community database projects, uh, specifically the Arts Boston Big List that we run in Boston, and the Berkshires Audience Initiative that we just launched out here in the Berkshires, and sort of how we got to that, um, how we got to that place, and especially about the replicability of, of that program, so that you could go back and, and start a program like this in, in your community. So a little bit about Arts Boston, just briefly. Um, Arts Boston is an art service organization. We're a nonprofit. We've been around for 36 years, helping to build audiences uh, and promote the performing arts and visual arts in greater Boston. We do that through a, through a number of programs. Um, we're sort of best known for our Bostics programs, which are half-price ticketing programs. We run the, the Bostics booths in Faneuil Hall and Copley Square. But behind the scenes, we work with arts organizations on professional development workshops, capacity building programs. Um, we run artsboston.org, which is um, the, the region's only comprehensive guide to all cultural events going on in greater Boston. And we also run these community database projects. So our ambitious agenda today is to um, get you up to speed on just what the heck is the, art, the uh, uh, Berkshire's Audience Initiative take a step back and sort of look at community database projects and how they've evolved so that you can understand how we got to where we are now. Um, what community database programs can do for you in your community, both for the individual arts organization and um, community-wide, sector-wide. And then at the end, finally getting to what they actually asked me to talk about, which is how you can do this in your, your community. OK, so, so first of all, what, what the heck is the Berkshire's Audience Initiative. So uh, how many of you have actually heard of the Berkshire's Audience Initiative? OK, that's not bad. Um, how, many, how many of you are from an individual arts organization? OK. And how many arts service organizations or arts councils? OK, interesting. So half of you might, might be able to learn about how you could start this in your community. And some of you might decide that you want this and go back to your your art service organization and, and uh, get them to do it. So the Berkshire's Audience Initiative uh, was funded by the Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation. I have to thank them. Um, and actually not just funded by Berkshire Taconic, but Jennifer Dowley from Berkshire Taconic really sort of dreamed this whole thing up. Um, so it, she, she came to Arts Boston and said, you know, I've, I've heard about what you're doing uh, with the, the Arts Boston Big List. We'd like to do something like that out here in the Berkshires. We worked together um, to, to figure out what the goals of the project should be. Specifically, they wanted to understand who their existing audiences were, because there wasn't a lot of data right now about who Berkshire audiences are. They wanted to increase their marketing effectiveness, to get better at, at bringing new people in and talking to their existing audiences, uh, and, and broaden those audiences. So beyond who we're just talking to now, how do we get, how do we get more people? Just to give you an idea of what sort of organizations participated in this, I, I know a couple of you are, are here. Um, it's, it's really uh, across the board. It was just open to nonprofit organizations in this first year. It's nonprofit cultural institutions of all shapes, all sizes, everybody from uh, Tanglewood, the BSO, down to, to you know, smaller, smaller organizations. There were 27 organizations <coughs> in total who participated in the Berkshire's Audience Initiative. So in, in order to really understand uh, the Berkshire's Audience Initiative, we have to talk a little bit about community database projects, what they are and, and how they started. So we'll start with the, the Arts Boston Big List, which we launched in 2004. Uh, but community database projects have sort of been around for, for 20 years or so. Uh, so it, the Boston Big List started in 2004 really as a way to simplify um, mailing list trades. Marketing directors from arts organizations came to us and said, listen, you know, we're, we're trading names all over the city. We're, we're calling up marketing directors. Either they don't call us back for two weeks in our mailing next week. Uh, we never know how clean the list is that we're, gonna, that we're going to get from them. Uh, we don't exactly know what names we're getting from them. So there's got to be an easier way. So Arts Boston got together and, and pulled together a, a, a group of organizations to work specifically on simplifying mailing list trades. So here's what it is. We take patron data 
specifically uh, in 2004, the big list was just ticket buyers. So we take ticket buyers for the last three years, we put them all into one um, giant database. In Boston, we have 40 organizations participating. In, in the Berkshires, we have 27. We merge it all into one database. We, we purge the duplicates. We identify those people who show up on, on multiple lists. We send it through the national change of address four times a year. What we're left with is one giant database of everybody who bought tickets in the region. In Boston, in, in 2004, the first year we did it, we ended up with 250,000 unique households of ticket buyers. So we did all that specifically to improve our direct marketing efforts. So everybody, everybody does direct mail. Well, performing arts organizations, they, they tend to do a lot of direct mail. Um, so how can we uh, save time for marketers by simplifying trades, cut costs by giving them the tools to uh, look at who their best prospects are before they mail to them? So how do you build the best list by looking at crossover between organizations? So where do you have a high crossover rate? So who should you be trading with? We overlay that database with demographic information, Experian and Equifax. If anybody, if you have a credit card, we know a lot about you. So we, we purchase that information, overlay that onto the database, so you can start to look at what your audience looks like and find people who look like that, if that's what you're going for. Find people who look like that in order to, to mail to those folks. But again, in 2004, it was really just about, um, just about mailing. And actually, in 2004, it wasn't even really a database that you could, it was a printout. It was like these dot matrix printouts that people would pour over and literally go down and say, okay, so my subscribers from last year, and here's how they crossed over with North Shore Music Theater and the Huntington. Okay, so I'm going to mail to those people. So we've evolved a lot since then. So this is where we're at now, which is, which is closer to what we've, we've done here in the, in the Berkshire. So we still, take, we still take audience data, but now it's, we realize that we have all this um, information in one database, but there's a lot more that we can do with it than just, than just mailings. So we still take patron data, but it's now broader than just ticket buyers. We take ticket buyers, volunteers, donors, uh, anyone who your organization um, touches. Oh, actually, just one last thing on, on the big list. One big problem with the big list was the trades were not permission-based. Anybody who put names into this list, they could be accessed by, by any organization anytime. So if you put names in, they were open to anyone. So what organizations started doing was holding back, they'd hold back their donors, they'd hold back their VIPs, they'd hold back anyone who they didn't want to trade. So, as I mentioned, we had 250,000 unique households in Boston, which uh, when, you, when you think about how many people are actually going to the arts, people are holding back a, a big percentage of their, their list. So we figured we, we needed to change that. So if we wanted to have better data uh, to do research on, we needed to get rid of that barrier. So now we take all patron data, donors, VIPs, ticket buyers, board members, but you can label uh, specific list as do not trade. So they're always hidden from anyone else. So they're in there for us to run research on, for us to, to give you reports on demographics, um, in order for the community to get a fuller picture of uh, cultural participation in the region. But nobody else, nobody else can see it. So we put it into one giant database, do the same thing, merge, purge it, send it through the NCOA four times a year. But now what we get out of it is knowledge. 24-7 online, you can log on and you can access this database anytime you want. There's knowledge that we get both for the individual organizations, actionable data about how, who their audiences are and how they can be talking to them, as well as um, community-wide, sector-wide knowledge that we can use for advocacy and for uh, et cetera. So on the individual side, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get through this quickly, but on the individual side, the types of information that, that organizations get, audience strengths. So you can look at your own data for the past three or five years and figure out what's our rate of churn been. How many, how many audience members are we losing? Who comes back every year? Is there a reason why we're, why we're losing those people? Just as an aside, one thing that we've found uh, across the country through projects like this is actually that arts organizations lose 
two out of every three patrons. So two out of every three patrons go to an event at your organization and then never come back. Now that's not a surprise. I think everybody knows that on an individual organization basis, there's a lot of churn. But what we found was that two out of three patrons never come back to anything in the database. They don't go back to any cultural organization. And I think the assumption had always been that maybe they're not coming back to me, but they're going to Hancock Shaker Village or they're going to wherever. That's, that's not the case. You learn the demographics of your audience. You can, you can figure out how that's changing over time. How many of us have uh, grants from funders to do outreach effort? And then we sort of make up stats about whether or not it's working. Just, this is actual statistics to show you whether or not you're achieving your intended outcomes. And if you aren't, you can go back to the funder and say, well, we didn't do it, but maybe here's why that wasn't happening, and here's how we think that we can, we can address it. Geographic penetration. Where's your audience coming from? Specifically, what, what zip codes perform really well? Um, on the Berkshires, obviously, we have a lot of tourists. So where are people coming from? Second home buyers. So, so it's been a little tricky out here. But um, so where are people coming from? But more, more importantly, where are the gaps? So where, where aren't you reaching? As, and as a whole, as a community, where aren't we reaching? Enterprise level view of patrons. So, um, uh, let me know if this sounds familiar. You have ticket buyers in your ticketing system, which isn't very good at reporting. You have your donors in, in a separate database. You might have members or volunteers in an Excel spreadsheet somewhere else. And you never actually look at all that information all at once. People who use Tessitura do, and there are some uh, ticketing systems that do that. But for the most part, we aren't looking at our entire audience that way. So for a lot of organizations, this is the first time they can look at that and see trends between ticket buyers, donors, et cetera. Cost cutting, so we still do list trades, um, but now instead of uh, having to pick up the phone and, and, and build a list, you can just go online, uh, and enter list segments that you're interested in, put it into your shopping cart, add uh, demographic appends, Presence of children at home, age, race, income, pretty much anything you, you might want. Really target that list and then um, just hit export and it's sent to you that night. In case you need to make a mailing list at two in the morning, you certainly can. So then on the, on the, com on the community side, so that's, that's all on the individual organization side. On the community side, what we get out of it is regional cultural participation. And this is, this is something that I think people, that we often miss. It's just, in its, in its simplest form, what we're able to do with this database is answer a question that for years nobody has been able to answer. What is our market? How, how many people are actually attending cultural events every year? And yeah, there's been survey data, which is self-reported, um, and ne it never really gets to that unique number of how many people are coming. I was talking to Michael Masso at the Huntington Theater last week, and uh, he was saying that that's, that's <coughs> the question that he gets most from his board chair, is what's our market share? What's our market penetration? And he's like, I, I can't tell you our market share. I don't even know what the market is. I don't know how many people are going. So for the first time in the Berkshires, those folks who have participated in this project can tell you what that market is, at least from these 27 organizations. Uh, also, uh, uh, community-wide, you can see crossover be between genres. So, you know, how is dance, how is dance performing, theater, music? Um, you can look at uh, uh, demographic information of the community, compare that to the, the demographics of the population as a whole. So what do arts goers look like compared to the, the Berkshire County, to, or to the Berkshire region? You debunk assumptions, for sure. Uh, I, one of the biggest things that, that always happens with these is organizations think that we're all sharing an audience. We're all sharing the same audience. And for the most part, crossover rates across the country are, are about 20%. So that means that 80% of arts goers are going to your organization and your organization only which I think is, is not what people expect to hear. 
And it's certainly not what we hoped to hear when we started this, this project, because what we, hoped, what we told people before we actually found anything was, you know, your audience isn't your audience, you don't own them, they, they, they go to everything, right? So you don't have to worry about sharing your list. So you don't have to worry about sharing your list. You really don't. That crossover rate hasn't really budged from that, that 20 to 25%. Um, but, it's, but it's interesting. And I think it's something that we can, we can talk about as a community and set goals of, do we want to increase that? What organizations are actually fostering cross, what organizations are sending people to other organizations? Okay, anyway, I got five minutes left. I haven't even gotten to the, how do you do it? <coughs> so actionable information. The, the idea is this is not just a research project. This isn't a report that someone has done on data from three years ago that is released and you read it and you say, that's really interesting, but it doesn't apply. It goes on the shelf and you never think about it again. This is 24 seven access to tools that should actually change how you're talking to your audience, who your audience is, how you're talking to them, and who you're talking to. So, so not just how you're talking to your audience, but who of other audience, potential audience members are you talking to? Okay, so here's some examples of, of what people have done. Uh, there aren't any Berkshires examples because it's still a, a fairly new program. We just launched it in, in March. Um, but so here's the Huntington. The Huntington, the big list is actually their only way to look at demographics of their audience. So they wanted to start a program for uh, audience members under 35 to get them to come to special nights and to um, encourage them to come more often. So they called it 35 Below. They um, pulled their names from the big list of people who were under 35, but they also mailed to the entire list for people who were under 35. This year, for the first time, we also added in email addresses. So we aren't able to share email addresses because that's illegal. But you can look at, um, you can look at your own email list and be able to, if you have the snail mail, able to get demographic information on your emails. So they're now able to email to people who are on their email list who they know are under 35. In, a, um, in San Francisco, Theater Bay Area uh, did a really cool, cool project where they compared, uh, like I mentioned, they compared arts goers as a whole, and they have over two million records in their database. This is a big database. So they compared arts goers to the overall population of the Bay Area, and then figured out is it representative? Are arts goers representative of the overall population? And if it isn't, what do we want to do about that? So they came up with some, with some answers. Um, you know, they do pretty well with white folks. Um, they don't do as well reaching African American audiences. So they're now talking to their member groups about how to, how to address that. They can go out and try to get funding to, to run specific programs to address that. And most importantly, track whether or not it's actually Philadelphia, in Philadelphia, um, Philadelphia is sort of the granddaddy of these data-based projects. Um, so they do some amazing work. This is a couple of quick examples. The Philadelphia Orchestra knew that they had uh, a lot of patrons coming from out on the commuter rail. I don't know what the commuter rail is called. But... Okay. So, um, so what they wanted to do was to get the uh, Delaware Valley Planning Commission to add more trains to come from, uh, to, to run late at night after their performances. So the, the Cultural Alliance in Philadelphia was able to take the data in this, this database, go to the, the commission and say, here's 11,000 patrons who would definitely take this train if you, if you would run more. And they got two late night trains to run after orchestra performances to, to take these people. Two other quick examples of what Philadelphia has done uh, from an advocacy standpoint. There was, a, there was a proposed arts tax in Pennsylvania, which has sort of been making its way around the country. And um, they, it, the arts tax is the, a tax on tickets for arts events. They were able to mail to the, the entire database and say, you're an arts, go, you're an arts goer, you know, stand up against this arts tax. The assumption by the government was that um, the arts tax would only affect rich white people, because those are the people who are going to the arts. 
Health Reliance was able to dig into the database and say, you know, that's actually not true. Here's, here's the actual demographics of who's going and who would be affected. Here's the, the average household income. Your assumption's wrong. Not only that, here's a map of everybody who attends arts events, and here's your district. One, one more step, we looked at voter records, and we overlaid voter records to this and found out that arts goers are more likely to vote than people who don't go to arts events. So here's all the people in your district, the people who are voting for you, killed it, and they killed it within a week. Oh, I'm out of time. My goodness. Okay, we'll, we'll skip this one. Here's some other, some other groups that are doing it. The Berkshire's Audience Initiative, it's not a contest, but we have the best name. Uh, Berkshire Taconic found us. We actually engaged a vendor. We don't actually do the, the back-end database management stuff. Uh, we just sort of manage the, the project. TRG is our partner in the Berkshires. We use a company called Entertex in Boston on our big list. Okay, so here's a timeline. There's also a checklist that's gonna go around if you wanna hand that out. A checklist on how to, how to create one of these in your community based on our timeline for the Berkshires. So Jennifer called me up in January and said, I'm interested in doing something like this. She did a lot of work behind the scenes. Jennifer was just amazing, not just funding it, but rolling up her sleeves and actually you know, making the sausage. Uh, so she did a lot of work behind the scenes, get, uh, getting interest. We came out a couple times, met with some, um, a group of, of key organizations, got their buy-in so that they could do peer-to-peer -peer selling. We hosted a couple of community events with 40 or 50 people to um, basically to, to present something like this to show them what they could do with the information. Uh, we created a task force, which is key. You'll see that as one of the, the key steps on your checklist. You have to have a task force that it really has to come from the community. It can't be coming from the art service organization. organization. We always say it's not Arts Boston's program, it's the community's program, and it really is. It, it will only happen if the groups trust that their data is safe. It will only happen if they, um, if, they if they participate. Task Force did all the work. Coming up with the name, thank you. TRG came out, did a, a recruitment session, and specifically helped people figure out how to segment your list. It takes a long time, it's a lot of work, but the data that we get out is only as good as what you put in. So it takes about six to 10 hours to actually segment your list and <coughs> upload it into the system. Okay, the, the first key learning is we didn't leave enough time for people to submit their data. We had a December deadline, only eight organizations actually made that deadline. We said, crap, we need to, we need to push back the deadline. We set another deadline in February, and the remaining uh, 17 made that one. And then in March, we, we officially rolled it out. We presented the, the key findings on the, the database. Um, or the organizations who participated were, uh, didn't know what the results were gonna be, so we all signed a confidentiality agreement, so I can't tell you what the results were, but they were really interesting. <laughs> and uh, so here's, here's basically what's, what's on, your, on your checklist, um, and sort of the, the, the keys to success. So I think we have 17 minutes for questions.